And um, so I'm going to give you a lot of scripture tonight. I'm going to read it to you, but I don't have any uh, PowerPoint presentation behind me for you to look at tonight. So get your pencil ready if you want to write these down or write them in the margin of your Bible, the verses, because I'm going to quote a lot of Old Testament uh, references that are speaking about the millennium, the thousand year reign of the Lord. So we'll get to those here in just a minute. But this is a shocking scripture that we read here. It tells us that at the end of the millennium, Satan's going to be loosed again from hell and he's going to be allowed on the earth to deceive people again. Now, why is that? Well, let me give you a couple of reasons. And these are not things that we haven't already discussed when we went through our doctrine uh, on end times. But there are two reasons why he's released the devil in order to deceive people. First of all, he's going to be loose for the same reason that he's allowed to tempt us now. To really show what uh, is in our heart. To show man what is in our heart. To show man that he's got to turn to Christ or he's going to face destruction. Um, People during the millennium are going to be no different than any other generation of people. They'll have a free will. They'll still need to turn to Christ for salvation. Therefore, they, they've got to be shown their need. Someone can't get saved uh, unless they know their need, right? We, we, we talk about it sometimes. We've got to get them lost before we can get them saved. Um, the fact that they turn to Satan so readily will show people their need for Christ in the most stirring way that you could think of. But, but note... As with all of the other generations, most people will ju- reject Christ and they'll choose to go their own way in life. Isn't that something? Most people are going to choose to follow Satan as it's been in every generation. Um, and number two, God's going to release Satan in order to vindicate the justice of God. That is, uh, in order to show people that uh, they deserve to be judged, that we as sinners at heart, we deserve to be condemned. And when people turn to Satan so readily and oppose Christ so easily, they're going to be without excuse, unable to say one word against the righteous judgment of God. So God's final and eternal judgment is going to be totally vindicated once he releases Satan um, from the abyss. So Satan's going to be released so that people will be able to see the utter corruption of their hearts. We don't like to think of that, do we? We like to think that, you know, we're pretty good people, that... We're all right that me and God, you know how some folks will say that, me and God, we got it together. Me and God got something going on. Well, that's not true. Not unless Jesus Christ is in the middle of that. If you're on your own and and counting on your own merits, nothing's going to get you there. But uh, Satan's going to be released so that we can see the, the corruption of our heart, the true corruption. And folks in that day are going to stand speechless before the righteous judgment of God. They can't say a word about it. So this passage tonight is the discussion of the return of Satan and his eternal fate. And let me just give you a little synopsis here of what we're going to talk about tonight. First of all, in verse 7, we're going to look at Satan is loosed. He's loosed. And in verse 8, we're going to talk about Satan um, uh, immediately deceiving the nations. And Gog and Magog are mentioned there in verse 8. Uh, The final armies of the world are going to be destroyed in verse 9 as we go through that. And Satan's going to be condemned forever and ever in verse 10. So let's look at those. We'll divide it in that manner. And uh, as I said, I have some scripture that I want to read to you and share with you. And I'll give you the reference uh, here in just a second. Now, Satan is loosed at the end of the millennium. And he immediately, the Bible says, deceives the nations. Now, who are that? the, The good question there. Who are these nations? Who are they? Weren't all the nations destroyed at Armageddon? Well, no. Scripture doesn't say that. There will still be people on the earth after Armageddon. Flesh and blood people who will go through the millennium. There's going to be survivors of Armageddon uh, who will become witnesses to the glory of the Lord Jesus when they return home to their nation. Now, let me give you some scripture on that. Isaiah chapter 66, verses 15, 16, and 19. For behold, the Lord will come with fire and with his chariots like a whirlwind to render his anger with fury and his rebuke with flames of fire. For by fire and by his sword will the Lord plead with all flesh and the slain of the Lord shall be many. And I will set a sign among them and I will send those that escape of them to the nations, to Tarshish, to Pool, to Lud, 
that draw, off the, um, that draw the bow to Tubal and Javan to the isles far off, that have not heard my fame, neither have seen my glory, and they shall declare my glory among the Gentiles. Zechariah in chapter 14 says, beginning in verse 16, Zechariah 14, 16, And it shall come to pass that every one that is left of all of the nations which came against Jerusalem, he's talking about Armageddon, shall even go up from year to year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. And it shall be that whosoever will not come up of all the families of the earth unto Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, even upon them shall be no rain. And if, if, and if the family of Egypt go not up and come not up, that have no rain, they'll have no rain. There shall be the plague wherewith the Lord will smite the heathen that come not up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. Secondly, there's going to be even some survivors of the bowl judgment still left on the earth. Not only survivors of Armageddon, those verses are referring to, but there's going to be some flesh and blood survivors of the bowl judgments that fell on the earth. These are the survivors of the, you remember we studied through this in Revelation chapter 16, but these are the survivors of the catastrophic earthquake that hits the entire earth. And in fact, it, it affects the entire universe when it happens. You remember us reading that. Um, and God destroys all of the ungodly cities of the world. The, the reference there is Revelation 16, all, all 21 um, verses, but really honing in on that in verses 17 through 21 of Revelation 16. Now remember this earthquake is taking place at the same time as Armageddon when Christ comes to the earth. They're simultaneous. They're all at the same time. But there will be some survivors. Um, let me read that portion of Scripture in Revelation 16, uh, beginning in verse 18 through 21. The Bible says, And there were voices and thunders and lightnings and, the, uh, lightnings, and there was a great earthquake, such as was not since men were upon the earth, so mighty an earthquake and so great. And the great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell. And great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give her the cup of wine of the fierceness of his wrath. And every island fled away, and the mountains were not found. And there fell upon men a great hail out of heaven, every stone about the weight of a talent. And men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, for the plague thereof was exceedingly great. All right? So you got... There's, there's two aspects of the people who are going to be here. There's another one. There's also going to be people who really turn to the Lord in the millennium. They're going to be saved during the millennium. Uh, Psalm chapter 87 speaks to that. In fact, I'm going to give you three or four references here. Psalm 87, beginning in verse 3, says, Glorious things are spoken of you, O city of God, Selah. I will make mention of Rahab and Babylon to them that know me. Behold, Philistia and Tyre with Ethiopia. This man was born there, and of Zion it shall be said this, and that man was born in her, and the highest himself shall establish her. The Lord shall count when he writes up the people that this man was born there. Isaiah 53.10 says, Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him, referring to Jesus. He has put him to grief. When you shall make his soul an offering for sin, he shall, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Jeremiah 33, verse 22. As the host of heaven cannot be numbered, neither the sand of the sea measured, so will I multiply the seed of David, that's believers in Christ, my servant, and the Levites that minister to me. Now when have the Levites ever ministered to Jesus? Up to this point. They haven't, have they? So he's referring to that time when that's going to happen during the millennium. Um, so there are going to be those in, in, the, in the millennium who are going to be saved. Let me give you one more reference, and then I'll go on to the next point. And it shall come to pass that you shall divide it. This is Ezekiel 47, beginning in verse 22. And it shall come to pass that you shall divide it by lot for an inheritance to you and to the strangers that sojourn among you, which shall beget children among you. And they shall be to you... As born in the country among the children of Israel. So they're going to be treated as children of God. They're going to be saved is what that's actually saying. They'll have inheritance with you among the tribes of Israel. And it shall come to pass that in whatever tribe the stranger sojourns, there shall, give you, there shall you give him his inheritance, says the Lord. And then there's going to be nations that are in existence when Christ returns to earth. 
Um, so it shows that there's going to be some survivors uh, within most of the nations, if not all of the nations. There will be some survivors who are left after Armageddon, after the great earth earthquake. There's going to be few, for sure, very few in comparison to the population before uh, Armageddon and before the trumpet judgments and the bowl judgments before Armageddon. Uh, but some will survive, flesh and blood people. It will be the people of these nations and the future generations that are born during the millennium that the Bible says Christ will rule with a rod of iron. It will be over these folks that he's going to execute justice. Psalm 2, Psalm chapter 2, verses 6 through 9 says, Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree. The Lord has said to me, You are my son. This day have I begotten you. Ask of me and I shall give you the heathen for your inheritance and the uttermost parts of the earth for your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron and you shall dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Isaiah chapter 2, the first four verses there says, The word that Isaiah the son of Amos saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem, and it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains, and it shall be exalted above the hills. All nations shall flow to it, and many people shall go and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of God of, of the God of Jacob, and he'll teach us his ways, and we'll walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And remember, this is all talking about during the millennium, right? Um, and he shall judge among the nations, and he shall rebuke many people. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. This is that time of perfect peace that we're going to have that's being referred to there during the millennium. Um, Isaiah chapter 11, uh, beginning in verse 3, it says, And God shall make him, speaking of Christ, of quick understanding in the fear of the Lord, and he shall not judge after the sight of his eyes, neither reprove after the hearing of his ears. But with righteousness shall he judge the poor, and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. And righteousness shall be the girdle of his lo loins, and faithfulness the girdle of his reins. Isaiah 65, verse 20 says, There shall be no more an infant. Now this is referring to the millennium, the length of days that we have. There shall be no more an infant of days. In other words, there won't be infants there who die young. Uh, there won't be infants there who are considered to be infants. It goes on to say, There shall be no more of an infant of days, nor an old man that has not filled his days. For the child shall die a hundred years old. But the sinner being 100 years old shall be accursed. So what he's saying is that if you die in the millennium at 100 years. Now we went through this and I know there's some debate on some of this that we went through in doctrinal study. But if you die during the millennium um, at 100 years old, you will have considered to be a young person, a young man or woman at 100 years old. People will once again in that near perfect state on the earth be living again for the length of days that we saw Old Testament saints living, the Old Testament prophets, not prophets, uh, but those um, prior to and just after the flood. So for somebody to die at 100 years old, it's going to be said that they're a child. Also, it could be said, well, if they die at 100 years old, they could be accursed. You know, there's something that didn't add up during this time. They weren't right with God. They hadn't reconciled uh, with God. Isaiah 66 says, They that sanctify themselves and purify themselves in the gardens behind one tree in the midst eating swine's flesh and the abomination and the, and the mouse shall be consumed together, says the Lord. For I know their works and their thoughts. It shall come that I will gather all the nations and tongues and they shall come and see my glory and he shall judge among the people and rebuke strong nations far off and they shall beat their swords into plowshares, their spears into pruning huts. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. So that's in Micah 4, 3 as well. Um, Zechariah 14, I'm just going to read a couple more references here to you, then I'm going to move on to the second point. Zechariah 14, 16 says, Shall come to pass that everyone that is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem, at Armageddon, shall even go up from year to year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the feast of the tabernacle. So there you see, there will be people there who will be going up to worship the Lord in Jerusalem, right? And it shall be that whoever will not come up 
of all the families of the earth to Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, even upon them there shall be no rain. And if the family of Egypt go not up and comes not up, uh, they will have no rain. There shall be the plague wherewith the Lord will smite the heathen that come not up to keep the feast of tabernacles. And then Revelation 11 that we've already been through, verse 15 said, And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven, saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Uh, that may be a familiar song that we all know. Revelation 16, 5 says, And I heard the angel of the waters say, Thou art righteous, O Lord, which are and was and shall be, because you have judged thus. Um, and then the scripture that we read tonight, I just want to call your attention um, where it says here in the last, uh, the last verse, A fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them, and the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Don't let anyone tell you that hell is an annihilation and it's over, it's done. This verse of scripture says otherwise, and there are other verses of scripture, and we know that we've been through that in our doctrinal study. Um, but they're going to be tormented, the Bible says, um, the devil that deceived them was cast in the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are. <clears throat> That's the unholy trinity. And they're tormented day and night forever and ever. There are some pastors that are preaching from their pulpit that they have not made up their mind yet. Can you imagine that? They've not made up their mind yet whether hell is going to be an everlasting thing or whether it's just an annihilation and it's over. Um, brother, that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says, and I hate, you know, I, I'm not saying this as though I'm happy about it. I, I'm grieved over it. But the Bible does say that if we reject the Lord Jesus Christ, that hell is a real place. It's burning. There will be torment forever and ever and ever. No end. Listen, heaven is for eternity. Hell is for eternity. I, I believe in heaven because I believe there's a hell. I believe there's a hell because I believe in heaven. And they both last an eternity. Again, not something that we ought to be happy about, that anyone would have to go there, but we've got this easy preaching from pulpits today that are saying things like that, and that's just one thing. Uh, but they're questioning the word of God. Uh, and this is one area where they question it, whether or not hell is real. And see, listen, if you're going to hell, i got to stay here. I don't have my thing on. I don't have my uh, mic on. But if you're going to hell, brother and sister, it's good news. Good news that uh, it, it doesn't burn and torment you forever, that you're just gone like that. And I've had people tell me when I was witnessing to them, you know, well, that's all right. They say one of two things. I got buddies down there. We'll just have a good time in hell. No, 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 no. That doesn't work that way. You're going to be in, in darkness. You, you won't even, all you're going to do is hear the screams of everyone around you and your own screams. Or they'll say something along the lines of, you know, maybe not just with, with uh, the buddies, but, well, that's all right. You know, I'll just burn up and that'll be it. No, 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 no. That's not it either. Um, we, we need to communicate to people in this day the sense of urgency to come to know Christ as Lord and Savior. You know, we had one of the children here back when we had the school here. I don't remember who it was, but one of the children made the comment that um, they wanted to go. They wanted Jesus as their Lord and Savior because they didn't want to go to hell. Well, I thought that was pretty good. I thought, you know, I don't know of a better reason. Do you? I mean, I don't want to go to hell. I, I love Jesus. I'm going to serve him. Absolutely. But I'm so thankful that one of the benefits of knowing Christ as Lord and Savior is that I don't have to go to hell. Amen. But don't let anyone tell you that they haven't made up their mind or they think that annihilation and it's over and you won't know anything after that. That's not true. When you were created, before you were ever formed in your mother's womb, let me tell you something. You were created and built to last forever somewhere. You're going to live forever somewhere. Now, wh where that is... You determine that while you're on this side of the grass. Amen? Amen. No place after you've died called purgatory that you can be prayed out of, you know? Who was that the other night on a faith visit? Was that you, honey? Visited somebody and they said, I'm praying for my brother. He died. He's dead now, but I'm praying for him to get out of hell. 
I thought, my goodness. But that's a false teaching of the Catholic Church, right? Um, right, yeah, the indulgences. You pay them a certain amount of money and they'll, uh, they'll jump through hoops for you. That was one of them. All right, um, yes. All right, let me, get, let me get on to the second part, verse 8. Um, Satan is uh, set loose at the end of the millennium and he will immediately deceive the nations, the Bible tells us there. Scripture tells us that not, <clears throat> or excuse me, that everyone on earth during the millennium, not, not everyone's going to be saved. Not everyone's going to be saved during the millennium. There are going to be many whose hearts will not belong to Christ. And uh, remember, Christ will actually be living in Jerusalem. That's where his palace is going to be. That's where he's going to rule from. He's going to be on King David's throne. And, and yet, the hearts of many people are going to be turned hardened toward him. Um, now we might ask, how could that happen? You know, preacher, come on. Uh, how on earth could that possibly happen when Christ is going to be ruling for a thousand years? How are people going to turn their uh, backs on it? How are they going to turn their hearts against him? Um, when he's actually going to personally, he's he's actually going to personally guide the rebuilding of the world cities. He's going to bring peace and prosperity to the earth. The people are going to know war no more. We just read that in two verses, right? In Micah and Isaiah. Um, but the answer is always the same. You know, how can that happen? It's always the same as, as, the, as the way it's experienced today and the way that it's been experienced uh, since the beginning of time. Never forget, when we ask that question, how can people act that way during the millennium? How are they going to say no to Christ and be, be lost and be judged and sent into hell? When, when we ask that question, you got to remember... Um, that God's own son, the Lord Jesus, came to the earth 2,000 years ago, uh, and yet people rejected him. They rejected him. Uh, many, many you remember when he was here, they denied that he was even the son of God, that he, that he was God's divine son at all. And today, despite all of the clear and unmistakable evidence that we have, especially for the resurrection, you know, if we could prove the resurrection, which we can uh, a preacher's worth his salt on Resurrection Sunday, on, on Easter each year. He ought to stand and preach of all of the facts that prove that Jesus came out of that tomb. He's, he's not dead. He's alive. Well, if, that was, if that's true, um, and we tell people that and, and they reject it, um, then they're going to get their, their justice from the Lord, right? I mean, he's going to have to judge them. Uh, but despite all of that evidence, the resurrection, and we can prove it, despite all of that, most people reject him. And that's true today, isn't it? The vast majority of people on planet Earth, they are rejecting the Lord Jesus Christ today. They, they reject the church because we stand for uh, exclusiveness, that Jesus is the only way. Not a good way, not the best way. He's the only way to get to heaven. And remember this also. The millennium is going to be how many years? That's a long time, isn't it? That's a long time. People around the earth, as we all tend to do, you know, you, you begin to fall into a routine. Year after year is going to pass. Then decade after decade. Century after century is going to pass. And we'll be living during those days. Some people may not even meet Christ face to face. That's what we read a while ago in Zechariah 14. They, 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 they won't even go up to Jerusalem. They won't even go up to the great Feast of the Tabernacles in celebration during those days. They just, they may never see Christ during that whole thousand year reign. You, when, when you think about how long that is, the routine we get into. And so as a result, what happens is just what happened when Christ came the first time. People are going to begin thinking of Christ uh, in terms of him being a mere man. You know, there he is, but he's a man just a man to many people he's just going to be a ruler he's just a ruler a man who's a ruler and and note how many people are going to follow the deception of satan it says they'll be numbered as the sand of the sea those that follow satan have you ever tried to number the sand of the sea or the sand on the seashore you can't number that can you that's how many people are going to follow him uh, and they're also he calls out the name of gog and magog and and these are the names i know that we we talk about gog uh being uh, Russia, Magog, uh, being the ruler, all of that's probably true. But I think more in, in this 
context, it symbolizes all of the nations that come from the north to fight against God's people, which may not just be only Russia. Um, it may be other nations as well that come down. So I think that's a symbol of all of those nations. Uh, Gog was the king of Magog. If you want to read more about that, uh, Ezekiel chapters 38 and 39, um, the uh, enemy from the north and from Jerusalem straight up, it runs right through Russia, right through Moscow, if you do some homework on that. But Ezekiel talks about that in 38 and 39 chapter. All right, then verse 9, Satan. The final armies of the world are going to be destroyed. The nations are going to march against Jerusalem and against Christ's throne, seeking to take over the world for themselves. Yes, that's still going to go on. That's still happening. Um, but there's going to be no battle. There will be no battle over any of that. The nations will misinterpret who Christ is, that he's the sovereign majesty of the entire universe. And, and, and they'll let the fact that he's come to earth throw them into thinking that he's only a mere man. I mean, he's just a man. He's just a, a man who's a, ru who's a ruler. Um, he's no different than, than we are. He's just, a, he's just another man. That's, that's going to, they're going to misinterpret who he is. And then without warning, God is going to immediately pour out his fire from heaven and devour them. Well, it is a good place for an amen, but it's also, it grieves us too, doesn't it? Um, let me read you some scripture that, that shows that. Jesus talked about that in Matthew 25, verse 41. Then shall he say also to them on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. 2 Peter 2 says, For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to chains of gloomy darkness to be kept until judgment, if he did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a herald of righteousness, with seven others when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly, if by turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to ashes, he condemned, condemned them to extinction, making them an example of what's going to happen to the ungodly, and if he rescued righteous Lot... Greatly distressed by the sensual conduct of the wicked, for as that righteous man lived among them day after day, he was tormenting his righteous soul over their lawless deeds that he saw and heard. Then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials, and listen to this, and to keep the unrighteous, the unrighteous under punishment until the day of judgment. And that's what we're reading about here. This is that day of judgment. And it goes on to say there, especially those who indulge in the lust of defiling passion and those who despise authority. Jude, verse 6 says, And the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he has reserved in everlasting chains uh, under darkness until the judgment of the great day. And that's what's being referred to here. Number four, and we'll be done. Satan, uh, in verse 10 Satan will be condemned forever. He'll be condemned because he deceived both the people and the armies of the earth. He led them astray, away from the Lord, away from God's way of righteousness. And for that reason, the devil's going to be taken and cast in the lake of fire with the Antichrist and uh, the false prophet. Um, and notice again that they're going to be tormented day and night for um, three years. No? Forever and ever. Some of you are awake. Um, he led them astray in that day away from the Lord. And listen, let me tell you something. He does that today. Satan does that today. He does that with so many of our people in our churches. It grieves pastors as we look out and we see the devil having his way with a family or a dad or a mom. And uh, we reach out and we try to do something to help. And, and sometimes your, your help is not welcome. Uh, sometimes it is. Sometimes it is when we see those things. But let me tell you, Satan is feverishly at work in this day and age, in this generation today, doing the same thing that he's going to do in that day. He's going to try to lead people away from the Lord. You know, I've told you in here before that um, I can't give you any... Uh, theological um, stand on this I can't give you chapter and verse on this it's just my heart okay based on scripture but I, I, I think Satan would rather ruin someone's testimony who is a Christian 
than to keep someone from coming to Christ. In other words, if, he, if, if, the, if the Lord God said, you, okay, you can only do one of two things, Satan. You either can uh, ruin this man or woman's testimony or you can just keep them from coming to know you as Lord and Savior, this person over here or that person over there. I think that Satan would take the former choice. I, th I think he would say, well, you know what? If I keep him from getting to the cross, I'm only keeping one man out of, out of hell. If I can ruin this man's testimony, I keep a whole lot more people out of, out of heaven and, 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 and condemn them to hell. And listen, let me tell you something. That's why I tell these grandchildren of mine and people that I know, and I know by my own life, Keep your testimony intact. Because if you lose your testimony, not to say God can't restore you. God's given me a do-over, you all know. You all know my story. But listen, there are people that I probably will never be able to share the gospel with. And there are multitudes of others that I've been able to share the gospel with over the last 20-odd years. Um, but when you lose your testimony... I mean, you have, uh, that, that's really the most valuable thing that you have as a Christian. Do you agree with me? Yes. Your testimony is the most valuable thing because how you live, uh, not that we, we, we're not saved by it. It's what I was preaching this morning, living godly in an ungodly world. We don't, we don't do things to please God in order to work our way into heaven. We do it to please God because we love God. And he's already given us heaven if we turn to him. But your testimony is the most valuable tool you have in witnessing to family and friends. Make sure you keep it intact. Don't let anything or anyone lead you down uh, another path that's going to cause you to lose that testimony. It takes a long time for it to become powerful again and strong again before some people will trust you and love you enough to say, well, you know, I think you're telling me the truth, but I'm just not sure based on what I saw you, the way I saw you living. So Satan is not going to do anything different at the end times when all of this happens than, than he's doing right now. He's not going to do it when, when, when during the millennium. He's not doing anything any different than he's doing right now. He's still going to try to persuade people to move away from the Lord, to move away from God's righteousness, to live for self and put self on the throne instead of putting Christ on the throne. That's his number one job. And so he's going to be taken because of that. The Bible says in verse 10, he's cast into the lake of fire with the Antichrist uh, and the false prophet to be tormented day and night forever and ever. Revelation 19 verse 20 says, And the beast was taken and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast and them that had worshipped his, his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone. And then again, verse 10, before I close it here. And the devil has deceived them, and the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Um, remember whose you are and who you are and never let, never, never let the devil steal that from you. You want to go into glory because let me tell you this. We talked about this already. We've been through it in Revelation. <clears throat> when the Lord comes back for his bride. Now who's his bride? We are his bride. He's coming back for a bride that is what? Pure, spotless, holy, you name it. That's the kind of bride that he's coming back for. And so collectively... That's who he's going to take with him into heaven. You talk about who's going to be raptured. I firmly believe in the rapture. And uh, who's going to be raptured? Those who have, uh, if I say this the wrong way, it'll make it sound like I'm saying that we're looking at works. I'm not. But those who endure to the end, you know the Bible says? Um, those, who, those who love Jesus with all of their heart, those who live their life in such a godly manner that they're seeking to draw other people to the cross. That's pure and 
spotless. And, and Jesus or James talked about religion that was pure, remember? Doing things for other people. Uh, it's that great commandment thing. Love the Lord God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength and then love your neighbor as yourself. All of that is part of making us spotless and unblemished. But I can promise you this. Um, and it's not, again, not something that preachers like to say. We wish we didn't have to preach half of what we preach sometimes. But I'll tell you this. If you're holding on to a private sin, something in your life that you're not willing to give up for the Lord Jesus, maybe you're not capable of giving it up for the Lord Jesus. I don't know what it is. The Holy Spirit's reminding you of it right now. But I can tell you right now, you better let God examine your heart, examine you, because he's not coming back for something that's spotted and something that's stained. He's coming back for a pure church. Well, preacher, we can't be sinless. No, but we can be blameless. Amen. Bible never said we won't sin. Bible says we, but we should not be... Uh, able to be blamed in something. In other words, when people accuse you of something before it's all said and done, they'll still be able to say, well, you know what? I was wrong about that because that's just not him. He didn't do that. That wasn't the way he did. People will lie on you sometimes. That's okay. That's okay. You just take it because when it's all said and done, it'll all come out. Amen. Not true. That's what blameless is before the Lord. And here's another thing that you need to take careful care of. You keep... Uh, a short sin list. A short sin list of confession. Don't let it string out there. And, and, and if you committed something, a specific sin, you confess it to God specifically, right? Don't say, Lord, just forgive me for all of my sin. If you committed a specific sin, I think we ought to get alone in our quiet time in a place where we have already set up. This is where my day is with the Lord, where my day begins or ends, whatever it is for you. And you confess those sins as God brings them back to your mind. You say, well, I can't get, when I, when I go to confess my sins, I can't remember. Just do it. God will remind you. Amen. He will remind you. Because he doesn't want sin in your life that separates you from him anyway. He'll make sure that you remember it and that you confess it and you give it to him. And you know what confession is? It's just agreeing with God. Lord, I'm a sinful man. This is sin in my life. And I need to give it up. So he's coming back for a pure bride, and you ought to, everything you can, watch yourself, be careful, and make sure that when he comes that you don't have sin in your life that would separate you from him so that when the rapture comes, we'll all go up at the same time. Amen, Alyssa? Amen. Don't you want to go up with me at the, at the rapture? Amen. I want to go with you. I want to go with you. I want to go with you. But I'll tell you what, if you don't go, I'm going anyway. <laughs> you know, I joke around with a pastor friend of mine. I tell him when the rapture comes, can you preach for me for the next three or four weeks? You know, because I'm gone when it comes. Amen. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Father, we thank you so much, Lord, for Jesus and the cross and the blood. Thank you, Lord, for what you did for us at Calvary. Lord, it was not you that should have been hanging there. It was me. And, and, Lord, I just am so grateful for the blood that you shed there that cleanses my soul, Lord, of sin. But yet, Lord, as we walk through this earth, sometimes some of the dirt and the filth of this earth will sort of just uh, scrape off on us, Lord. And, uh, Lord, we pray that you would help us to remember that it's so vitally important to confess our sins but here's the great news, Lord. Help us and remind us that if we confess our sins, you're faithful and just to forgive our sins. And then you do something so wonderful. You cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God, what a promise that is. You don't need a perfect vessel, Lord. We know that, but you need a clean vessel. And so, Lord, examine our hearts tonight. And, uh, and Father, see if there's anything within any of us, Lord, that might disgust you or that might stand in our way, Lord, of being blessed uh, by your hand, Lord. We know that sin separates us from you, Lord, and help us to always be thinking ahead and looking for that place where you have promised a way of escape, Lord, in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, uh, that we can get out of temptation, Lord. We don't have to stay there. You've always made a way that we can escape it. Help us to do that, Lord, as young men, as young women, as old men and old women, Lord. 
Uh, help us to escape temptation, Lord. Show us that way out as you have promised to give to us. And so, Lord, tonight we just give praise and honor and glory to you, Lord. We're looking ahead to that day when this earth is going to be near perfect for a thousand years. We're going to be here with you. And then, Lord, after that, the new heavens and the new earth are going to come down out of the heavens onto this earth. And, uh, Lord, we're going to be here to reign with you forever and ever and ever. What a wonderful, wonderful day that's going to be. And so, Lord, we're praising you tonight, and we know a million years from now we're going to be praising you, continuing to praise you into millions and billions of years later, Lord, because eternity is something that we can't even wrap our minds around, Lord. God, go with us tonight as we head out to our homes. Be with us. Give us a safe journey in our cars. And, uh, Lord, as soon as we put our feet on the ground tomorrow morning, I pray, dear God, that you would help us to be looking for people who either need you or know you and help us to be wanting to find that out. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. God bless you. I love you.